You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Freedom is all about choices. And while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xe, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War, episode 191, A Jewish Homeland. This week, a big thank you goes out to Michael, Randall, Edward, Andy, and Doug for supporting this podcast on Patreon, where they now get access to special ad-free versions of all of these episodes, as well as special Patreon-only episodes, like the ones on conscription in the British Empire, which we'll be releasing uh, roughly a day after this episode airs. If that sounds interesting to you, head over to patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar to check it out. As a special programming note, after the last two special episodes, we are now back into our normal episode setup, and with my speaking engagement completed, I will hopefully be back to a normal weekly schedule, uh, which has sort of been all over the place recently. I had a fantastic time speaking at the UT Southwestern Medical Center, always interesting to discuss the Great War in person with people instead of speaking into a microphone. But now, we are back to our discussions about the Paris Peace Conference. Over the last few normal episodes, we have been covering how the Ottoman Empire was broken up by the Allies at the Paris Peace Conference, and today we will discuss the final peace that was created from that old empire, the Mandate of Palestine. So before the war was over, an important decision had already been made by the British government, and with its official backing in the 1917 Balfour Declaration, they had decided that there should be an area created for the Jewish settlers. In the Balfour Declaration, the British committed themselves to providing a homeland for those Jewish settlers in Palestine. With this idea confirmed before the end of the war, the British politicians and leading Zionists started to hash out the details. By the time that the delegates began to arrive in Paris for the conference, most of those details were already worked out, at least in theory. Then throughout the conference, agreements were reached with other countries, and with Faisal, who was slated to become the leader of Syria, which the Jewish area of Palestine would of course interact with. Of all of the decisions made at the conference, the creation of mandatory Palestine, which would in time become the nation of Israel, stands out for its destabilizing effects on the region. It remains a divisive topic even today, and whether or not you or I think it is the correct decision cannot change the fact that for the last 100 years, the area around what in 1920 would be called Mandatory Palestine has seen constant tension and multiple armed conflicts. Many of those conflicts and the animosity present between the Jewish citizens of Mandatory Palestine and then Israel and the Arab peoples that surround them can trace its roots back to the decisions made in London and Paris from 1918 to 1920. A key player in our story and in the history of Mandatory Palestine is Chaim Wiseman. Wiseman was a chemist who lived in England before the war. When the war started, the British government put out a call to all of the scientists in the country, asking for any discoveries that might be of use to the military. Wiseman had discovered a new way of fabricating acetone, which was a critical component in the creation of artillery shells. With the British frantically trying to expand their production of shells, Wiseman's idea eventually ended up on Churchill's desk, and Wiseman would receive the news that the government needed three 30,000 tons of acetone as soon as possible. The money gained from these huge orders of acetone, created through his process, gave Wiseman the money to push forward his goal of of getting the British government to support the creation of a Jewish homeland. 
His work, and the work of many other Zionists, would eventually result in the Balfour Declaration from the British government, which for the first time gave the Zionist movement the official support of a major European government. With the declaration released, the next step was to start laying the groundwork for actually creating a Jewish area in the Middle East, and making that a reality meant working with the Arabs, and it specifically meant working with Faisal Hussein. Faisal was slated to become the leader of Syria, which Palestine was up to this point a region of, and so it was important that Faisal and the Zionists come to some kind of agreement. To this end, Wiseman and Faisal would meet in May 1918. This meeting was very important, and so the British put a lot of work into making sure that it went smoothly, going so far as to hash out many of the details with Faisal before Wiseman even arrived, so that there would be no surprises. They pitched the idea that if a bit of territory was given over to Jewish administration, it would look very good for the Arabs. The Jewish leaders would be able to take that goodwill from the Arabs and then use their influence to help the Arabs at the peace conference. Also, it would just have really good optics for the Arabs, to borrow a modern marketing term. At this early stage, Faisal could see the benefits of working with the Jews, and when he met with Wiseman, the Zionist was very pleased with the results, saying, This first meeting in the desert laid the foundations for a lifelong friendship. The emir was in earnest when he said he was eager to see the Jews and Arabs working in harmony during the peace conference, which was to come, and that in this view the destiny of the two peoples was linked with the Middle East and must depend on the goodwill of the great powers. When the Paris Peace Conference began, it would not directly address the desires of Wiseman and the Zionists until late February. During that time, the Zionists would frequently discuss the matter with the leading statesmen, but it would not be in the official business of the Supreme Council. These types of backroom conversations were very important to the overall functioning of the conference as a whole, just as important as the official meetings almost. One example of these meetings, and I include it here because I think it's funny, was at one point, Wiseman would meet with President Wilson, and the president would ask Wiseman if he got along with the French. Uh, Wiseman would respond, I speak French fluently, but the French and I speak a different language. Apparently, Wilson felt much the same way, and they had a good laugh about it. From an official perspective, the most important meeting for the Zionists would occur on February 27th, 1919, when they officially appeared before the Supreme Council. They sent three representatives to this meeting, Nahum Sokolov, a Polish-born Jewish leader who had spent the war in London. He would discuss the role that Jewish people had played in helping the Allies win the war. Next up was Wiseman, who would discuss the sacrifices made by Jews during the war. And this final speaker was a Frenchman, a Sylvain Levi. Up until this point, Levi and the other Zionists had been of one mind about what should be done after the war, with everyone seeking the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. However, at this point, Levi shifted, speaking instead from a viewpoint that was closer to the official policy of the French government at this time. This was at a point where the fate of Syria and Palestine, and really the entire region of the Levant, was still very much up in the air, with both the French and British trying to assert their control. Levi would say that he believed that creating a Jewish national homeland in Palestine might endanger other allied interests in the region. This was the policy of the French government, because they did not want to give up their own control over the region that would eventually become Palestine. Wiseman would say of this moment that he was profoundly embarrassed, and he would later say that the astoundingly unexpected character of this utterance, it was not for this purpose that he had been invited as the Jewish representative, constituted a public desecration. Levi's speech put the Zionists in a bind. It would look very bad if they started arguing in front of the Supreme Council, but Wiseman was saved by the American Secretary of State Robert Lansing, who would ask Wiseman a question that moved the conversation away from Levi's viewpoints and allowed Wiseman to take control of the conversation again. Lansing would ask, What do you mean by a Jewish national home? This question allowed Wiseman to outline the general plan, which was to be very accepting of non-Jewish citizens in the areas to be settled. However, the long-term goal was, through immigration, to turn the area into a purely Jewish country. 
After the meeting was over, and after a very cold meeting between Levi and Wiseman, the French would issue an official statement that stated that they would not oppose a Palestine under British mandate. The French also said that they would support the creation of a Jewish state in this mandate. The use of the specific term Jewish state is very important in this statement, because up to this point the Zionist leaders had been very careful to not use that term. They did not want to appear to be conquerors or imperialists, but with the French using it, the Zionists felt that they could begin to change their rhetoric. From an official standpoint, this was the end of the discussions about the Jewish state at the conference. With Palestine under British mandate, and with the full support of the British government, the fate of the Zionist idea of a Jewish national home was all but assured. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Freedom is all about choices, and while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xE. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xE, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. While the fact that Palestine, under British mandate, would exist was now a settled fact, there was of course the nuanced conversation that would have to happen about where precisely the borders of this new region would be, a conversation that would have to happen between the British and the French. The problem started with the fact that there was no pre-existing political entity known as Palestine. The Ottomans had just lumped the area in with Syria. When it became clear that the British would have the mandate of Palestine and the French of Syria, the exact delineation between the two areas became a very important topic of conversation. The Zionists led off this conversation by stating that they hoped to gain northern Galilee, the Golan Heights, the Gilead Mountains, and 18,000 square kilometers on the east side of the Jordan River. This was not the limit of what they actually wanted, but after lengthy conversations with the British, the Zionist leaders were convinced to hold back on their requests for political reasons. Most importantly for the conversations between the French and the British, this list of requests put the border of Palestine much further north than the French had anticipated. There would not be an agreement about, the, about this border for months, and it would not be until September that the conversation was revisited. It was at this time that the British started to pull their troops out of Syria to give the French control, and this meant that the British troops had to move south, which of course begged the obvious question of exactly how far south they should move. Negotiations began with both sides wanting different things. Eventually, they would agree to what would become the modern-day northern boundaries of Israel and the borders of modern-day Syria and Lebanon, with one exception. This exception was the Golan Heights, an area with a very, let's say, complicated political status, which I won't really dive into here. All I will say is that in 1919, it was part of Syria. While all of the political decisions were being hashed out back in Paris, the future mandate of Palestine was under a British military administration led by General Allenby. 
Allenby had been the British commander that had led British forces into Palestine in 1917, and he would just roll directly into being the leader of the military administration after the war. This was not a great time to try and maintain the peace in Palestine. The military attempted to control the area within the confines of the rules set out by the Hague conferences, and this meant that they would try to maintain the status quo until the future was officially decided. In 1918, the status quo was that Palestine was not yet a Jewish national home, and this caused friction between the Zionists and the military, with the Zionists criticizing the military leadership for being biased against them. On the other side of the conversation were the Arabs, which made up 90% of the population of this area in 1917. They were concerned about what was happening and the rumors of some of the decisions being made in Paris, and so there would also be friction between the British and the Arabs. Major General Watson, one of Allenby's subordinates, would say that the antagonism to Zionism of the majority of the population is deep-rooted. It is the fast leading to hatred of the British and will result if the Zionist program is forced upon them in an outbreak of a very serious character. One of the main causes of friction between the British, Zionists, and the Arabs was Jewish immigration to Palestine. In 1917, the population of Palestine was less than 10% Jewish, uh, with only about 50,000 Jews living among 610,000 Arabs at the end of 1917. Over the next few years, the population would begin to rapidly change. By the mid-1920s, the Jewish population would almost double. This put serious pressure on the agreements originally made by the Zionists and the Arabs. The new Jewish immigrants wanted to buy land, and in the early days, they were able to purchase that land easily. But by 1920, the situation began to change as it became harder to purchase land due to the rapid increase in cost as Palestinians began to resist the seemingly endless tide of Jewish immigrants. Wiseman would say, we found we had to cover the soil of Palestine with Jewish gold, and that gold for many, many years came out of the pockets not of Jewish millionaires, but of the poor. While Wiseman was not a fan of the situation, it was perfectly natural for the cost of land to increase rapidly due to the demand, especially as the Arabs began to resist the idea of losing so much territory to Jewish settlers. Many of the Jewish immigrants were also not on the friendliest terms with the Arabs. They often viewed the Arabs around them as primitives, almost in a European colonialist mindset. This kind of imperialist mindset that believed that the presence of more civilized Europeans would pull those around them into the modern age had been a key factor of European colonialism for centuries, and it was not well received by the Arab Palestinians. This hostility between the Jews and the Arabs also began to create a unified Palestinian opinion and viewpoint, something that had not really been present when the area was under Ottoman control or in the early years of the Mandate. All of these tensions would burst out in April 1920. It would be on the first weekend of April, which was Good Friday weekend for the Christians, Passover for the Jews, and Nebi Musa for the Muslims. In Jerusalem, all three religions would hold religious events. Friday and Saturday were fortunately free of incidents, but then on Sunday near the Jaffa Gate, after some words were exchanged between a group of Jews and Muslims, riots broke out. Wiseman would later say that Arab mobs fired with fanatic zeal, attacking any Jews they happened to meet. That description, coming from Wiseman, may not be entirely accurate, but it would take several hours for the British authorities to restore order, and by the time that they did, five Jews and four Muslims had been killed and 200 Jews and 22 Muslims were wounded. The military administration would come under attack from both sides, with both Jews and Muslims claiming that they had favored the other group. The Jewish riots were just the first of two important events for Palestine in April 1920. The second was the Sam Remo Conference that began late in the month. At this conference, Wiseman pushed for a civil administration of Palestine, which would still be under British control, but not the British military. This was mostly just a push for the British mandate to start, which required a civilian government. On April 25th, uh, he would voice this opinion to Balfour and Lloyd George, and it would be made official that the British would pursue the creation of a mandate in the region, removing the military administration. It was at this point that the Zionist goals were actually achieved, but it was barely the beginning of their journey to the creation of a Jewish state. 
With the official creation of a British mandatory Palestine, there were now three groups interacting in the area. The first was the British Civilian Administration. They had played an important role in the creation of the mandate and in its use as a Jewish national home. However, some within the British government were now concerned about what they had created. They realized that their government had supported the creation of a Jewish homeland in the area, and but it also had a massive Arab majority. And that very same government had spent four years during the First World War encouraging and inst stoking the fires of Arab dreams of independent Arab states in the Middle East. These two projects were almost mutually exclusive and bound to cause problems. The British Foreign Minister Curzon would say that personally, I am so convinced that Palestine will be a rankling thorn in the flesh of whoever is charged with this mandate that I would withdraw from this responsibility while we yet can. On the side of the Jews, Wiseman was still a leading figure, but he found that he also had to be both a mediator and a moderating influence. Some within the Zionist movement wanted to push immediately for an independent Jewish state, throwing off the shackles of the British mandate as soon as possible. There were also a large number of American Zionists who were pushing against the leading role played by the Europeans within the movement. They pushed for more freedom for the Jews within Palestine and claimed that Wiseman was acting as a dictator. The Americans also joined the more radical European Zionists in their calls for an immediate creation of a Jewish state with a wholly Jewish government. The third group in the equation were the Arab Palestinians. Remember, they made up 90% of the population of the mandate, but they found their role in the new administration of the territory to be almost non-existent. They had not been consulted when the British and French had made their decisions about what the borders of Palestine should be, and they were also not consulted on the mandate's government. They were also, there were also no illusions among the Arabs about their future. News of the Balfour Declaration and the goals of the British Mandate were clear. No matter how many promises that the British made or the Zionists made, the Arabs would never truly trust them. And that is where our story today just sort of ends, without any actual resolution. The tensions created in Mandatory Palestine, which would continue to be a mandate until 1948, would never really end. The only difference between 1920 and today is that the British are no longer an important player in the region. The tensions between the Jewish settlers, later Israelis, and the Arab Palestinians would never be resolved. There's no real end to this story, and it's still ongoing. It's just another problematic legacy with its roots in the Paris Peace Conference and the First World War. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you will join me next episode as we change our focus slightly to look at the other empire that was destroyed at the end of the First World War, Austria-Hungary.